More labor unions are going on strike to force government to meet their demands. Government's failure to pay Tier 2 contributions on behalf of workers, coupled with necessary but burdensome taxes, paved the way for labor to fight back. Organized labor boasts of at least 700,000 members, and if the unions continue to strike, Ghana could have a burgeoning labor crisis on its hand, one that risks bringing tertiary education to its knees. What does the middle ground look like for organized labor? That's another crucial question coming up in this episode of Hot Issues. As of now, Senior Staff Association of Ghana, the Federation of University Senior Staff Association of Ghana, and Tertiary Workers Union are on strike. The absence of each of these groups at work has significant adverse impact on education as we see today in the closure of university basic schools in Accra and Kumasi. I am Kemini Amano and on this episode I sit with a man who speaks on behalf of organized labor as the forefront trade unionist. Edward Karoe is an economist and my guest on Hot Issues. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Mr. Karoa. Thank you, Kemini Amano. Let's talk about the TUC, whom you represent today over here. The TUC is the umbrella worker organization for okay. this country. Um, uh, the TUC has many branches. That is what which we call affiliates, unions. And then even apart from that, there are other associations of workers who are not under the TUC. But when it comes to labor issues, the TUC is the mouthpiece of uh, workers in this country, and uh, that's why we call ourselves organized labor. Right. So organized labor is uh, the body that encompasses all worker groups in the country, and then the TUC speaks for all of them. So let's talk about labor issues then. The first on the table is labor agitations around the 15% increment, or 15% VAT rather, on uh, electricity. Why is labor agitating and protesting that? Well, we need to put this uh, question in context and then to let Ghanaians know why we are doing this. Workers are not against taxation. Workers are not against government policy to tax people, to raise revenue, to be able to finance uh, social projects and other developmental projects. Um, but we are certain in our minds that this country, we cannot tax ourselves to development. We can't tax ourselves to development. We cannot also tax ourselves out of the challenges that we are facing. What we can do is to increase production. And production which will lead to creation of jobs, which will lead to more uh, deployment of resources, then we can get out of our current challenges. But what we have been seriously against mm -hmm. is that when you look at electricity uh, costs in Ghana today, it's almost outside the pocket of many, many Ghanaians, particularly working people. And uh, we also have these uh, utilities being reviewed quarterly. So every quarter, um, the, the rates will be reviewed yeah, but and they have uh, never I mean, come I mean, down. Oh, 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 that's not true. Over the last year, the, the PURC has, has had some uh, d decrease in, in tariff for electricity. Do you also know that over the last year, uh, we have had electricity uh, rates going up, up to uh, 72, 73%? So if once in a while you have a, a marginal decrease, the overall, you know, uh, position or view or situation is that prices always go up. I see. So, so this, this electricity going up by 72% was regulated by the PURC? Well, because of course every uh, quarter the utility providers will come with their budget, the reason why prices should go up. Well, well, yeah, th that's right. But I'm trying to understand where you got the 72% from because the PURC has never... Uh, I haven't heard that the PRC has approved any increment. No, cumulatively. 
cumulatively. cumulatively. That's the point I'm making, that yes. even cumulatively we will not reach 50%, let alone to get Why not? to 72%. What, what, what were the numbers that contributed to this? Should I give you the yes, statistics? Yes. I'll give you the statistics. We don't speak without statistics, and we speak based on the figures on the ground. Apart from that, but the generality, whilst I get you the statistics, mm. is that prices of utilities do not come down. Because there's no way out one can say that the cost of electricity today is less than the cost of electricity in uh, last year or last two years. Absolutely. So the trend is clear for all of us. What it means is that come the end of the next quarter mm. or this quarter, we should expect to pay more. Because prices of goods and services, cost of production will go up for those uh, utility providers. Mm. And they will come to UPR, uh, uh, um, PURC with their cost mm. and then asking that it should go up. Well, I understand the point you're making. I just yeah. want to make sure that the, the, the facts we are using to support the, those, the points you're making are accurate. Uh, while we do that, I, I want to bring in the points that only last year, the labor front had a 23% increase in, in base salary to, to be implemented this year, 2024. By June, the government hopes to increase it by 2%. Um, if we take cumulatively the last seven years, government has gone up as much as 30% in increment of salary. And so when Labour makes the point as though uh, government is only raising the taxes without looking at the other side of it, it is an untrue observation that Labour is making. Well, we are making the point that if you look at what government gives to workers as compared to the taxes that we have, it takes away every you know, increment that has come to workers. And it, we, are, we should not be looking at all of that. There are a number of taxes that all of us know, a government of them up to 40%, I mean four, uh, 40 different types of ta taxes that government has imposed on us. They are varied. So, when, again, when we are also talking about um, the taxation, we are also talking about the fact that the city is depreciating. And there's no uh, argument that if you look at the value of workers, wages is far lower than the, the, it used to be, even though the nominal figures have gone up. These are real facts. Because if you take your salary now and go to the market, the volume of goods and services that you will, have, you will be able to procure, as compared to the same volume of goods in the past, you will not be able to procure that. So generally, cost of living has gone up. Mm -hmm. And it has gone up because of government management of the economy, which is mainly also taxation. Hmm. So at this uh, point in our economic life, where workers are already uh, uh, suffering, Ghanaians are already suffering, we see that it is not too uh, uh, labor sensitive or worker sensitive or Ghanaian sensitive to come and impose taxes on our consumption of utilities. Hmm. You know, utilities are not a luxury. You know, why will you tax us because we want to have electricity in our homes. You know, of course, they, will be, they are saying that the lifeline is there. Mm -hmm. But that lifeline, even what they have given, many of the people who are falling under the lifeline end up paying more than that. Because when you consume more than 30 kilowatts, then, of course, you have to pay the tax. So it does not matter when they say, okay, uh, three bulbs, uh, one uh, pressing iron, or one fan. Mm -hmm. If you have them and you don't use them, at the end of the day, you will be paying or you will be consuming within the 30. But in many instances, depending on the way you use them, then you will even go beyond the, 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 the amount of energy right. uh, so, that is So I, I hear you also say that despite the increment we are going to see in public sector rate wages particularly, uh, it is not enough to cover for... Uh, the increase we are seeing in, in cost of, of living in this country and the VAT is going to break the back of, of labor. But I want to understand what engagements are going on right now. Well, the, what we know is that before government imposed these taxes, there was no engagement. Labor was not, you know, engaged. Labor did not give their consent. Labor did not contribute anything to it from nowhere Government has given directive to ECG and then uh, to, to implement. Did, did, did the government have to consult you? Why not? Labor. Are we not Ghanaians? Mm. 
Because on whose ticket is the government ruling? I mean, it would have been a catsy call on Labour, but did, did it, was it a must that they consulted you? You, you see, we have, we have indeed made nonsense of democracy. What is the essence of democracy when you will not consult the people? We are custodians of the democracy. Is it because we have voted them to be in power? They think that they cannot consult us. What is the meaning of democracy to the ordinary uh, Ghanaian? It's consultation, listening to them. And if we are workers group and we are leaders of workers and you think that you will not consult us just because you have got the power to do whatever you want to do, in any case, even with this imposition of the tax on the electricity consumption, they are referring to the act. This was there in 2013. Why is that all these years they have not implemented it? Can they tell us that Ghanaians are now better off to be able to absorb that particular tax than we were in 2013, 2014, 2015, to date. So what has brought about it now? Hmm. It is all just because government has become helpless and it is now in the hands of IMF and just doing what IMF tells them. Hmm. But it's also because we have mismanaged our economy to the point where we have to run to IMF. And when we, we do that, they take over your economy. So certainly, government has every reason to consult us. If they don't consult us, of course, as Ghanaians, we would also take our own course. Right. So after the facts, are there any engagements now with, with the government? Well, I, there's no amount of engagement is, that is going to uh, appease us unless government withdraws the tax. Do you think that's possible? What is not possible? I said that since 18, that, uh, 2013, that... Uh, they refer to the act that this provision was made there, it has not been implemented. And in any case, does it mean that if this tax is not imposed today, or 2024, there will not be Ghana? The economy will go extinct? So certainly, it is government choices. This is a choice of government to think that it is in 2024 that we can impose this tax. So we are saying that you must withdraw it because we cannot pay and we will not pay because those who are imposing that tax have got the ability to pay. Some of them do not even pay taxes. I mean, it's ridiculous that the, the people who are, who are better placed mm. are those who are not paying taxes. Okay. Even where they are paying taxes, they are giving money to pay the taxes. And we, those who have nothing, you know, we don't have other perks. We have nothing get near ordinary workers taking 150 CDs. 200, 500, are those who are to pay the taxes. So certainly, those who are implementing or making these laws for us and making these policies and trying to implement them, look, they are better place to pay the taxes. I see. But we are saying we are not. So we will not accept it. I, I don't know if you found your numbers. I found it. Ever. Yes. Uh, let's, let's hear the numbers on I found it. how much increment we have seen yeah. over what period. We note, and this is the... the Organized labor statement uh, on 23rd January, just uh, about to, three days ago, mm -hmm, yes. when we, we read. We say that, we note that since 2022, electricity tariffs have gone up by 73%. Mm. Since 2022. Since 2022. Yes. Now you're putting it into no, perspective. In perspective. Yes. You can see that. So it will never come down. By the end of this year, even with our government imposing these taxes, given the mechanism we have put in place, that is reviewing the taxes uh, every quarter, it will still go up. It will go up. It will be more than the, uh, the, the 73%. Mm. I see. I, I do want us to look at uh, other issues concerning what could happen by um, Wednesday if government does not raise or remove the 15% VAT on, on uh, electricity. Uh, mind you, the ECG has also said that it will not be able to uh, do that at this point. What will happen? Well, we have been very clear in our statement to government. We are saying that we cannot pay. We can pay and we will not pay. When we come back, a bit more on this and then... Other issue, issues concerning organized labor. Don't go away.
Thanks for staying with us here on Hot Issues. Our guest today is Edward Karoe, who is General Secretary for the General Agric Workers Union. He's also a trade unionist and an economist. And we're discussing organized labor issues and concerns uh, since last year up until now. We already started with a 15% on VAT. Uh, let's wrap it up on that. If it's implemented, which could be out of your hands, what's the plan? It's clear. We we'll do what we do best, we will strike. And it is our right to strike for our leaders to know that they cannot be insensitive to our plight. They must listen to us. And we are saying that if they do not implement this particular policy, Ghana is not going to go extinct. Mm. You know, the economy will still run. And that is what we are saying that, please, we are all seeking to have peace in this country. We are all seeking to have industrial peace and then to make sure that we work together to improve our economy. But if government takes it upon itself without consultation and without recourse to the suffering of us and decide to continue or go ahead with this, the implementation of this VAT on uh, mm. uh, electricity consumption, after 31st, which is Wednesday, certainly labor is not going to sit down. And of course, you know, we'll go on strike. Mm. Speaking of strike, there's a section of labor already that is on strike. Uh, the Senior Staff Association of Ghana, who have also been joined by, by TEWU over a very important issue that spreads across uh, public sector labor, the Tier 2 pensions contributions. Tell me about how crucial this issue is to public sector. Look, you see, government is simply just joking with the matter. Those unions that are on strike now, they are not the only people who are suffering the branch of government not paying. There are many more public sector workers whose uh, pensions have not been paid. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is in the public sector, it means government has not paid. Paid the tier two contributions they have no the last nine months. Yes, they have not paid. So if these workers are on strike and government thinks that it is only them, they should not, they should better deal with the situation, uh, you know, decisively. You, Otherwise, uh, it sounds like you're, you are inciting the others to go on strike. Why as well. not? Am I not a worker? Am I not a worker? What is my duty? Am I the one holding their monies? It is government. And if we have every reason to sound to government that please, there's a danger ahead. Why will you say that I'm inciting? The fact is that, have you paid the others? Are they the only public sector workers that you are owing their tier two? No. The others will join in the strike. What I'm understanding is the strike is illegal. <laughs> well, what government is doing, is, is that legal? Is that legal to keep people's monies and you're not paying interest on them? And then you are jeopardizing their future. Is that legal? Could it have been better if uh, organized labor had gone through the procedure of going on strike? We have gone through the procedure. We have already some notice to government, for instance, like we have indicated to them that by 31st, they must. No, that's, that's, call off. That, that's for the VAT. Yes. But I'm talking about SSAG, which is on its own, obviously, uh, not. not uh, uh, under the TUC, you are supporting an illegal action. That's the point I'm making. <laughs> I'm saying that, you see, those who will call us an illegality, are their actions legal? Are their actions legal? You know, the thing is that, you see, let's know that democracy goes with the rule of law. And rule of law is applied to everybody. Government does not respect the law, it does not respect the rules. And when they breach the rules, those who are the custodians of the rules and those who are supposed to hold stakeholders to comply, they cannot hold a, a, a government to do that. But when la labor is going on strike, then they jump in and say that it is an illegal strike. Mm. Look, let me tell you, we shouldn't get to that point. Look, what is illegal to a hungry person? My future is at stake. All those who are uh, applying these policies, all those who are keeping our money, when they go on retirement, they have got ex-gratia. How many Ghanaian workers have got ex-gratia? So, 
Even the little that we have and which we are contributing, it is our money. It is not even government money. So why will you keep it? Mm. You, you know? So government must be called to order mm. to do the right thing. So, so at this point, the government would have to pay 3% interest on all the contributions for the workers. They have to pay. Mm. And whether they will pay. If they, are not, if they are refusing to pay for nine months, do you think that government is intending to pay the 3% interest on it? No. Why do we make laws, make rules, and government can break those rules with impunity and then call on labor that you should not make noise? Because it is our future. We have nowhere to go. We have no ex gratia and so on. You know, it is your last salary that you go home with when you go on retirement. Right. And, and at this point, uh, Labor, SSAG, that is, and uh, Tewu are in negotiations with the Labor Commission. They have refused to call off the strike uh, at least twice already. Um, wh where does this end? Where do we get to the point where we say that those are the receiving end of the consequences of the strike? Um, you know, are, are listened to as well. You know, you can easily um, get a strike call off when government makes a definite and clear commitment to the demands. These demands are not frivolous. These demands are not excessive. These demands are legitimate. You owe the workers. For nine months, it's not even two months, it's not even three months, it's not even four months. Nine months, you owe them. It's legitimate. You know, so what government needs to come to the table to do is to say that I voted this amount of money to pay off. I will pay off seven months. Then you can enter into reasonable negotiations. But how do you negotiate when government does not come on the table to say that I am paying it? You can negotiate. Should, should the rules around illegal strikes be applied at this point? Um, or when they are due, perhaps? You see, you should not, we should not just be looking at the end result. When you go on strike, the strike is a built up uh, from something. Mm -hmm. It's the end result of a certain cause. And in this particular case, it is government that has caused a strike action. No, I, I, I so understand how do you that. tend to say that no, no, the I workers are uh, I, a strike I, is illegal? I, I understand that. The question I'm asking is who will bear the consequence of the strike at this point if we are applying the rules of illegal strike? Uh, whoever wants to apply the rules of the legal strike can go ahead and apply it. Because the thing is that you can apply it on workers and refuse to apply it on government that has caused the strike action. I'm saying that government owes and government has not denied that they don't owe. And I'm saying that it is not two months, it's not three months. So that you say that the workers are unreasonable. I also say that the, the owings is not only about those who are on strike, yes. but many more other public workers, government owes them. So it is not in the interest of government and the interest of anybody for workers to sit down and allow government to continue to owe and increase the owings. So what the workers are doing, it is, in fact, it's good for this country. Because if you don't pay your debt, and then the people go on retirement, what are they going home with? You know? So government must set up. If they were paying every month, because the money has been deducted, where did government divert that money to? You know, they diverted it for other purposes. You know? And government must not be allowed to spend money in that manner, more in particularly when this money is for workers and it's for their future. And for clarity, what you're asking is that the tier two contributions are deducted both from salary of, of the employee and from the employer. Yes. So you're asking those deductions that were made, where did they go to? Have you had an answer or has government responded to organized labor where those monies went to? Look, the answer is clear. Government has misapplied it. Misapplication here means that where the money is supposed to go to, government did not put it there. Wherever they have sent it and they want to justify it, it's misapplication of the resource. And you all know to do that. The law does not permit that. So again, it is law that says that government, please, you have a responsibility for the worker to contribute and then you to contribute to it and pay same to a particular agency. That is the law. Government takes the money. It does not mm -hmm. pay that. Is government complying with the law? Who is holding government on? Now, the people who are the victims 
and bearing the brunt of the government illegality and insensitivity right. are now being held in contempt that they are what? Uh, their strike action is illegal. Where from those authorities? Well, well, uh, you know, the, the, other, the other point also will be why organized labor didn't choose to go to court to, have, uh, to force the hands of government to pay the monies due over this illegality. You see, if you have a number of options, you can choose whichever you want. Going on strike is the right of workers to do that. Going uh, to court absolutely. is also our right. Absolutely. And we, we, we will choose what course of action well, so the point we should take. Is, so the, rightly so. But the choice you, have making, you have made now is causing students who should be in school and having uh, 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 you know, services from these groups... You are denying them those services because you chose, you know, an action that could have consequences on them. Who is more responsible than parents? Those who are on strike. We have our children in the universities. My children are there. Many are of those who are on the strike have their children at the university. Who can cry, uh, cry more than they breathe? Who is more a Catholic than the Pope? Those who think that we are insensitive and workers are insensitive, that's why they are going on the strike. They should sit up. Well, it, the, the people who are insensitive is government. Could, could it be that organized labor is only taking advantage of the times we are now because, you know, we are nearing the elections and you just want to strong arm the government to ensure that you are paid instead of, you know, taking the less, the, you know, the, the less hectic route of going to the courts and having, forcing the government's hand legally to pay those uh, contributions for you and not have any consequences on the services, the very important services you provide to uh, people out there. Kemeni, do you know what it means to go to court? Do you know what it means? And if government can sit down and for nine months holding that money and keeping it, and then when we now choose to just strike, then... It is like we could have gone to court. Please, I'm saying there are choices. We have decided to strike. Mm. Kola was one of the things that organized labor haunted the Mahama administration with. It eventually, you got a 10% increase uh, back then. We know things have uh, improved, gone to 15%. Are you looking forward to an increment in the future? Well, we have just started with the year. The 2024 budget had just begun to, mm. I mean, they just started implementing it. Uh, if the economic situation worsens, certainly we would demand for a cola. And the uh, government has given public sector workers 23% from January to uh, 30th of June, mm -hmm. and then 25% uh, from uh, 1st July to 31st That's December. Great. So it will be premature to uh, be asking for cola now, but ask government has already demonstrated mm. that they want to tax us every way uh, possible for them, then of course we would demand that. Mm. And you see, one of the things government is putting in our minds is that the 23% they gave us from January to uh, 30th, you want to take it from the uh, uh, taxing us using the electricity. You know that. Because the time they were Giving us that the 23%, all of us had the understanding that given the economic situation at the time, all things, other things being equal, the 23% will be able to take uh, care of us until 30th of June. Little did we know that government is coming with this barrage of uh, 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 taxes. Now that government has introduced them. If we get to a point where we can no longer hold. We'll call on government again for a uh, cola. Mm. I see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we know that UTAG recently uh, talked about conditions of service uh, allowances, which also, again, it's not just UTAG, but it's also something that applies uh, on, on the general front of, of organized uh, labor. To help us understand what these conditions of service are and why it's important for government to pay attention as UTAG is also threatening to strike. Well, you know, we have laws in this country. We have also got the Labor Act, which allows uh, uh, worker groups to enter into mm. uh, negotiations 
to determine their conditions of service. And then these conditions of service, which sometimes are called collective agreement or whatever name you give them, are reviewed periodically. So it is within the law um, to review these conditions periodically. Mm -hmm. So if a particular worker group uh, conditions of service are expired, then they have the right to sit down with government to review that. Apart from that, some of the things that are creating the agitation is that conditions have been agreed upon, government refuses to implement them. Like, like what? For instance, uh, some are complaining about uh, market premium. Mm. Some are complaining about overtime allowances that have taken them off. You know, And when you're looking at these things, you have to look at them case by case. You see, case by case in the sense that when someone presents his case, then you have to look at where is this case coming from? What was the preceding conditions? Mm. Is there any provision in it that you should enjoy this? Mm. Has it been implemented? Or part of it has been implemented? You know, so you look at it case by case. So if a particular worker group goes to government and they have got their case, government must listen to it. Indeed. And when they don't listen to it, of course, it again, part of the, their right under the law to uh, withhold their uh, uh, services or get government to sit up and do what they, are, they ought to do. So these things will, 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 is, can easily be prevented mm. when government does what it is supposed to do. You, you, you know, there are a few more things I want us to talk about, like minimum wage yeah. and, you know, how labor is faring under this administration generally. But I do want to uh, bring into perspective observations many have made. The, the fact that it would seem that issues now compared mm. to the period 2013 to 2016, uh, there seem to have been a, a one voice on the needs of organized labor. What we are seeing now is certain groups agitating for things that the entire labor group actually needs. Why? Why is that the case? Well, um, there are many groups. Then out of the many groups, we form the organized labor. There are issues that are general to all of us. And then uh, when they are general to all of us, we come together and make uh, our position clear on them. But we don't see that You're, now. Yeah, this, we see it. You recall that? Uh, we see it where? Because uh, on the VAT issue, TUC has, sp TUC has spoken. Uh, on, on, on the conditions of service is UTAG. And then on the tier two pension, which, are, which cuts across all, of, all the groups uh, under organized labor, we also only see TEU and the SSAG dealing with it. What's going on there? Well, if you take UTAG, conditions peculiar to UTAG will be dealt with by UTAC, and that's what they are doing. Now, this particular uh, pension, the tier two, is general to all of us, but this group of workers have taken the lead to do that. You see that it was FUSAC, the senior staff association of the universities, that started the strike action. Then TEWU joined them. Mm -hmm. Now, if the it, government is unable to resolve the matter, other worker groups will join. You think so? Yes, we will join. You see that? That is what the, 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 the danger is. And it is in the interest of government and in the interest of the economy and in the interest of industrial peace mm. for government to resolve the matter before it w gets to that point. Would someone be wrong to say that organized labor's response to or actions towards this current administration is um, it's more understanding and compromising compared to uh, you know, the, the period 2013, 2016, when uh, John Dramani Mahama was president? Well, I, I can say that uh, when this government was coming to office, they made a lot of promises uh, to Ghanaians and to workers as well. So when they came to office, of course, we have to give them time to implement their uh, 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 promises. You know, so for 2017, 2018, going to 2019, they're about you could see that there were no many labor agitations because we are reasonable. You have made some promises. You say you do A, B, C, D. But we have now come to realize that mm. they are not fulfilling them and the situation is getting worse. So like when government, before this government came, they were talking about nuisance taxes. In fact, some of us, 
we didn't know about that adjective. Uh, you can attach that adjective to taxes, nuisance taxes. And that when they come, they are going to develop this country through production and not taxation. Today, is that the case? We have every reason to now hold the government on because when they say they were going to lead this country to a development paradigm through production, they are now de deteriorating the economy through taxation. You see? The taxes are not taking us anywhere. The taxes are making us poorer. So why do you think that as rational beings, we will still keep quiet over it? Is it the case that you were given the Akufuadu administration time or it's a matter of... Because again, if I'm using your own argument, yes. John Dramani Mahama became president in 2012. Yes. And there was a long spell of election petition. So, you know, the actual drive of the economy began after the, after the uh, you know, the election petition. So let's say latter part of 2013 into 2014. Uh, but organized labor did not give him the same grace period uh, you have for the Akufuadu administration. No, I wouldn't like to say organized labor. We didn't come together to say that we are not giving government uh, a briefing space. What happened at that time was that individual worker groups based on their peculiar demands, went on strike. Mm -hmm. You see that. And you cannot take it away from them. But issues, I could remember there was one of the issues that had bordered on, a, on a, a electricity and water, where we were going to have a national strike on that. Then government intervened and averted it. So organized labor works this way. Issues that are general to all of us, organized labor picks them. Individual worker groups, when they have their issues, they go on their own strike. So it isn't like organized labor plan that will do this unless the issue is uh, general to all of us. And in this particular one, which we are doing now, it is general to all of us. You recall when they came to, uh, they were trying to uh, haircut our pensions. We came together and gave government an ultimatum that our pensions should not you know, be subject mm. to haircut. Mm. You know, that's organized labor. I see. I, I think that organized labor understands its importance in the whole polity here. And occasionally it takes, you know, very good advantage of it. But I want to talk about the grace period again. Um, is it the case that perhaps before the Mahama administration was given the boots out of office, he had fixed some of the issues that... Um, like with single spine, some of the issues had been dealt with. And so then the, it, it was easy to give the Akufuadu administration some grace period until other issues came up. Would you agree? Well, uh, governance is a continuum. And econo economic uh, uh, effects take time to uh, manifest. You know, some are long term, some are short term. So some of the investments that were made under the uh, uh, Mama's regime, their effect, you know, came in the era of the uh, MPP. Mm -hmm. So certainly we have it. For instance, the investment that was made in energy, you know, to uh, stop uh, Dumso, heavy investment was made. The full effect came in 20, 2017, 2018. So certainly the, the, the issue of Dumso was no more pronounced as it is. Right. Until recently where it is, uh, bringing its ugly head again. You see that. So, again, so that is why you will see that it is like we've given someone a, a, a grace period. If government makes investment today, mm. some of the investments would have immediate effect and some will manifest years later. So, should government not be in power and a new government comes, then the new government will benefit from that. So, so what is wrong if John Dramani Mahama says Labour should give him a honeymoon period. There's nothing wrong to ask us to give him a honeymoon. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is that, look, you see, um, we don't know how long you want us to give you the honeymoon. We, well, want you, you, you... we want you to prepare. We are no more going to sit down. I mean, you can't tell us now that we should give you a honeymoon. We are saying, no, don't tell us that. Prepare and make sure that when you take over, you will solve our problems. You see, but to say that we should give you honeymoon, I, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. It isn't that we will not understand government. But when government, we get there, and government brings its, you know, 
proposals, and we see reason with it, we see reason with it, then we can make certain concessions. But we cannot give uh, uh, your mama a blanket uh, Acceptance that Again, I don't, when you I don't, come, we'll give you more. I don't, I don't mean to belabor the point <laughs> yes. and compare both administrations, but labor, organized labor's actions leave a lot of questions. Uh, to, to, to be answered. Because again, I don't think you consulted uh, the Akufuadro administration on how long their honeymoon would be. But you gave them a full term of honeymoon. Organized labor issues came up uh, 2020, 2020 and post. And so you, you cannot make the argument that uh, you, you don't know how long John Romani Mahama wants a honeymoon. You could also say that you observe, but you outrightly said, no, we won't do that. We are saying that we have suffered so much to a point where we would like the your mama to be aware, His Excellency, to be aware that it will be very difficult to have a prolonged honeymoon, if there will even be honeymoon at all. We also know, because we are part of the, the governance system, we know that it takes time to put in place your ministers, to put in place so many other things. Those things can be, uh, uh, can be considered. For instance, we would like the next government to immediately halt the exodus of uh, our medical staff. Mm. You know, you must come out with ideas to, to, to resolve that. I mean, we cannot keep too long about that. Many nurses are running away day in, day out. The statistics is just too, I mean, uh, uh, frightening. So, something of this nature, do you say that we should say what? We would like him to come um, uh, uh, when he comes. He should resolve those matters. So the point, again, is just that. Mm. We are ready to work with government. When government makes pro, uh, uh, proposals to us and we see reason for it, we agree with, with them. Very for well. instance, government size must be cut. Government today has refused to do so. We have called on government to cut the size of its ministers mm. and appointees and the rest. Why? They are not doing it. Mm. So certainly we will we, we'll be up in arms, in arms with them. Mm. But, but then, then I take it as you must be impressed when John Romani Mahama makes the promise that he will work with a smaller government. Why not? Okay. Now, we'll leave it there. When we come back, I would, I would have you assess uh, your own living standards. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest is Edward Karua, who is a trade unionist. We've been discussing um, issues important to organized labor. Edward, I want you to assess your own living conditions now and, you know, uh, before. Assessing what the, if you, if you would like to call it a SWOT analysis, assess what is being uh, between both administrations. Well, I think that uh, my living standard is worse than before. Uh. Uh, cost of living is far higher than before. And uh, I struggle now to make ends meet than before. And there are uh, unemployment situation in the country is far higher than before. Cost, uh, pr uh, price of goods and services are higher than before. Uh, so generally speaking, the economy is worse than before. Mm, so is, 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 is this a, does it resonate generally with all of organized labor? And I ask that because, again, minimum wage is no longer what it used to be. Um, you've had one of the highest increases in terms of base pay under this administration, 30% I mentioned in 2022, which was applied in 2023. Um, COLA has gone up from 10% to 15%. We have named all these things already. Let's not go over that. And you still say that your, your living standards are worse off in, under this administration than the previous? Yes, I've said that we are worse off than before. Uh, what you have, the statistics you have given, is nominal figures. We are talking about the value. What can those nominal figures acquire goods and services? It's less. It's, it's less. It's not just about the percentages that we, our figures have gone up with. It is about what those figures can acquire now as compared to in the past. If you take the, 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 the CD to the dollar, what was the rate in 2016 and what is the rate today? You see, that alone, you know, 
wipes out any increments that you will get. You see? So, it's first and foremost, and that is one of our major problems mm -hmm. about people who are using statistics. And I've challenged those statistics that we don't eat statistics. Statistics do not put food on the table for us. We are talking about what we can acquire. If we are better off, someone should tell us how many Ghanaians can easily go to the market and buy the things that they have to buy. Many parents have become worse off than before because their children have completed school and they have no jobs. They still continue to depend on them. Today, many parents, those who have gone on, uh, on retirement, their pensions have been uh, uh, haircut. They are asking for payment. Government has defaulted on that. So certainly, they are worse off than before. Even we, those who are working and we are not yet on retirement, any investments we made, there has been a haircut on them. So we are worse off than before. Our pensions, which they have to be paying every month, it is in areas for nine months. And who knows when they are going to pay? We are worse off than before. So the indications are there. The facts are clear on the ground. Mm. We will not limit ourselves to uh, statistics that do not have a positive impact on our lives. The reality is that we are worse off than before. And I've given the examples, mm. you know, that shows that we are worse off than before. I see. I want us to also talk more deeply about the uh, minimum wage. Uh, you say things are worse off than before. Then I assume that the 14 cities minimum wage uh, uh, you, uh, at the moment is no longer enough. What are the discussions around that right now? Well, you see, minimum wage is just about a figure that um, uh, government employers and then uh, labor, the trapatite said to uh, agree upon. Mm -hmm. It is not a living wage. The minimum wage we have today is far, far inadequate to keep a family. We all know 14 cities and something. How do you, uh, uh, how can 14 cities, you know, provide for breakfast for two parents and three children? We all know. So certainly it is no good. It is no good. But then when we then come to the, disc the negotiation table, there are many factors that come into play. Much as all of us agree that it is no good, we also come to realize that government will not be able to pay. Because we, the money which ought to be available for that is not there. It's not there. Corruption, we have seen how many millions of Ghana cities going to waste. People are accused of embezzling money, this, and creating losses here and there, the people are not held accountable. Everything is saying that, oh, the law is this. When it comes to issues of corruption, it's not, you can't resign to only legal yes. jurisprudence. You have to also, it is a moral issue. When you see people's lifestyle changing, and you cannot even, you know, uh, pin them down to a particular criminality, mm. and their source of income, mm -hmm. they cannot be in your government. And the president started well when he said, anybody who wants to make money should know that you cannot make money in my government. I see. What role does politics, and again, party politics within the ranks of uh, organized labor play in getting organized labor where it is now or where it has been before? Well, I think that uh, our, the type of politics we have played in this country over the period has uh, undermined labor unity. Look, you go to the ministries, when ministers are coming into office, they dismiss a number of uh, civil servants and come with their own people. You know, the closer has been raising this uh, concern, you know, and even it is not because they are raising it. When you go, you see them. How do you go with your own secretary? The institution is there, there are secretaries there. When you're a minister, you enter there, there's a secretary. You don't dismiss all those people, you know? But this is what is happening. So the party politics has really undermined labor mm. and then also undermined productivity. 
Because the people they bring in do not have the competences like the others. But just because you were probably employed under a particular government, then they think that you have come, I mean, you are aligned to that uh, government, but you are a, a civil servant. Mm. So politics has really but, undermined the productivity in this country. But, but is it only other ministries or within the ranks of organized labor, so for instance, TUC? Uh, politics also seems to have infiltrated that place, hasn't it? Well, if you take the TUC, for instance, we are unionists. We also have our labor politics, but it is not partisan politics. Mm -hmm. It is not partisan politics. You see, it's not partisan politics. But you see, in spite of that, the partisan politics, you know, when workers are being brought by a particular, you know, uh, minister, for instance, and then in that particular workplace, there is a need for workers to have a common voice to fight for an improvement. Those workers who have been brought in by that particular minister will not join. So it, it undermines their unity. So overall, given the partisan politics that we play, which we have allowed it into the public sector and the civil service so deep, it has indeed undermined labor unity, it has generated conflict, and then it has also uh, undermined productivity. And it has also given labor the reputation as to is available for the highest bidder. I don't understand that, that we are available. Oh, you, you, know, you know exactly what I'm saying. No, I don't you? know. In the lead up to the 2016 election, Labour was frolicking a lot with the NPP. In the lead up to the 2024 election, we see Labour frolicking a lot with, with the NDC. Are you saying that they are giving us... I, the, when you say the highest bidder, that's what I want to understand. The only the thing is that... The, the thing is, we are not... We are non-partisan. We are looking at policies... For instance, if we subscribe to the 24-hour economy, it is not partisanship. We, as TUC, have developed our own workers' manifesto. And we are saying all the political parties must take what is there. So any policy that will lead to uh, uh, employment creation mm. is what we uh, uh, subscribe to. I understand that. Yes. So, so, you know, supporting the 24-hour economy mm -hmm. by itself is not what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. I am saying that the observation that has been made over mm -hmm. the period mm -hmm. is that, again, and I'll use 2016 and now, yeah. in the lead-up to the 2016 election, mm -hmm. organized labor was, uh, was in the, you know, entangled itself a lot with the NPP, at the time in opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, NDC in opposition, we see you, Again, frolicking with the, uh, the opposition party. Why is that the case? Let me, because I'm very, uh, I was part of, I was there during the 2016. Mm -hmm. It was not only organized labor that were uh, subscribed to what the MPP was telling us, but many Ghanians, what they brought, they came with a lot of promises. Why is the opposition always more attractive to you? Because no, that's what you see no. now. The word you are using, the opposition is not always more attractive. Uh -huh. We are looking at policies, and I'm saying that the 2016 policies, some of them were excessive promises. And you see, it takes many people, or very few people, to know that some of the policies that were being promised at that time, they could not implement them. But free education, free SHS, who will say he does not want free SHS? But then, we've had it. It's a, a disaster. It's a disaster. They cannot pay. Uh, parents have to pay. I had two of my kids. One went with the old uh, system, and the other one was in the free SH. I didn't see any difference. In, in fact, my expenditure was <laughs> almost. I'm, I'm trying to so, let so, you know. So, that. so Mr. Kara, again, I, I want us to settle <laughs> yes. up on, on this issue <laughs> of being the highest bidder. It would seem. Whoever gave you the most promises and the most interesting promises, organized labor will go with them. No, no. You also have to understand that we don't go with every promise. We don't go give, with give every promise. Give me an example. Because we, uh, can I give you an example? It, it, yes, please do. Yes, even myself. It was TV3 uh, that uh, uh, came to our uh, hall there mounted uh, their system and they interviewed us. 
we did uh, you know, I oppose, I challenge the one village, one dam policy. I see. Because I saw it as not feasible. Mm. It was not going to be workable. Then uh, the following day, it was in headlines. So you were the lone voice no, I'm in only, the flock. I won't say I'm the lone voice. I'm just collecting one thing up. I myself got involved. So I want to use that as an example to tell you that it was not all the promises that we fell into. But it, admittedly, we fell into, we fell to some of the promises that today is a fiasco. If we are, if we, we rewind, we will no longer accept some of those uh, promises. Mm. And it is not only organized labor. It's about the news. Because the many promises, we are seeing they are not there. Certainly. I see. Yeah. I, I want to talk about your workers' manifesto, which you say you want, uh, you know, the, the political parties uh, to work with. What is in it? Well, it encompasses the entire economy. We are talking about employment. We are talking about energy. We are talking about social dialogue. What have you? And this workers' manifesto. What we have realized as a TUC is that the political parties decide what is good for labor. We decided on our own to put our manifesto and then give it to them mm. if they will buy into it. You see, that's why we developed this. Mm. You see, and we have different committees. I am a member of the Economic and Social uh, 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 Committee. Mm. And then we have political committee, we have this committee and so on. So we put all these things together, you know. So we are inviting the political parties to take our manifesto right. and make sure that they implement that. What has been the response to and reaction to the manifesto? Of course, so far, we've had a uh, NDC came in and that was uh, when it was launched. Also the 24 hour, we gave him the, the manifesto, Joe Mama. We invited uh, the vice president, uh, His Excellency the vice president, and then he asked for time. The time he gave us, he said, The vice we'll president again. hasn't engaged you. He has not yet uh, engaged us. Mm -hmm. But when he comes, we'll, engage, we'll give him our manifesto. I see. It is the document that allows us to assess policies. So uh, you were talking about the observation, the impression, and the rest. People's observations is not always right. Even though some of them observations may be right. If you are going to observe what we do, I will entreat all Ghanaians, those who want to observe us, and then either see whether we are mm. doing well or not. Yeah, you should look at uh, our manifesto. Because all policies that we are going to critique so what, what kind, will be based on it. Right. So you what kinds of policies are in there right now? In That's this, what I'm saying. Uh, we are we are showing uh. how employment can be generated. Okay. And employment is one single huge you know challenge for this country mm. once we're able to deal with unemployment then all other things but does it also tackle uh, you know how to deal with the brain drain problem of course uh, when there's mm. employment there will not be brain drain mm. you see many people are running away because there's no employment in fact many people pretend uh, claim to work in but what they take home does not take them home but this, this seems duplicitous in the sense that uh, the party manifestos and even what the NDPC does with whichever party wins the election already takes into account job creation and employment and, you know, uh, labor needs and wants. And so, I mean, it seems like a duplicitous or that those ones are not enough. It's not necessarily the case. But when we look at um, there are, the point about employment creation is generic. How to create the employment and how to create decent employment it's probably not what they are doing you see if you look at the under the planning for food and jobs they said they were going to create employment mm. you can see it but then what type so what, of, what would this be adding to no, that what type of jobs did they create okay. uh, jobs that were indecent jobs that did not exist jobs that no one could live on i'm just using that as an example to show that you can have a policy that says that you want to create uh, jobs how do you create them today Many Ghanaians are having indecent work. That we have uh, provided a solution for it in our manifesto. You know, the energy sector, how we can manage this, our energy sector. Government is deviating from that. It thinks that it's taxation that is the solution. We say no. Mm. You see, taxation is not the solution. 
Now, we want to grow the economy. Mm. We think that importation is the solution. We say no. It is production. Right. Edward, I want us to quickly uh, talk about TUC, ex TUC expectations going into the 2024 elections. Um, again, maybe TUC will be a bit narrow, but what is organized labor expectations going into the 2024 elections? Well, uh, as workers, we want, we are happy that we are in a democracy. But we want a democracy that expresses itself by giving the people the opportunity to choose their own leader. What is worrying, and which is not only to us, is the way we are monetizing the politics. It is the one who can pay more now gets it. Everywhere we see it, we hear it, that people, those who are participating in the political uh, office elections, they are buying people. They are using money. And that itself smacks of corruption, because where did you get that money? To do that, you know, those things are there. That is the point about using money. Mm. The other thing is about the way the uh, uh, security deals with people. You know, we don't want elections that people get injured, the security go there, they fire at them, and so on. You know, we want elections to be violent free. You see, to be violent free. So that also is also a. Uh, 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 Another thing. The other thing is that our leaders, when they get the opportunity to sit before the cameras and everything, they use language that is very bad. They insult. Mm. And we are very much angry with that. Yet they call themselves honorables. We get, I mean, how can you be an honorable and you are insulting people? It's a bad thing that they are teaching the younger ones. So those things, whilst we uh, contest for political uh, office, we should be decorous. We should, temp we, we should be temperate. Mm. We should be civil in the language that we use. You know, after all, but you can see, you are a journalist, you people have been going around giving us the information. Because we watch the TV, watch, yeah, listen to the news, and we know what's mm. happening. It's violence everywhere. Last year, the uh, clergy came to the realization that it had let it get its guard down and had, had allowed politicians to uh, use them, particularly in election year. Uh, what measures is organized labor, labor uh, putting in place to ensure uh, that uh, you are not used by po politics or politicians? Well, I think this is a very big challenge for all of us. It's not only organized labor. Certainly, organized labor cannot do it alone. The clergy and other uh, groups that are there, we all have to come together and then make sure that this year's election is not like what we have experienced. You know, we would like uh, violent free mm. elections. No, but do you, do you so admit on. that politicians use organized labor as well? No, when you say organized labor, I don't understand. Because they, don't, they use people who are workers. They use the clout of organized, but they don't labor, use organized labor to reach the no, rest of the public. No, they don't use organized labor. Because as a body, they don't use us. But you can find some of some workers mm. who are being used. They, you can't describe them as organized labor. That, but, I mean, we, we, again, I, I come back to the issue of within the ranks. We have heard so many times about how, uh, you know, people within the groups who say they feel their leaders have gone for money and are calling off strife or strikes or are holding back on their protests and, and agitations for, for their demands. And so it brings us to the point, the, the point of the question I'm asking. Do you admit that sometimes or in the, in, the, in the last few years, organized labor has also been used uh, by politicians one way or the other. And perhaps you are learning lessons from that. No, I don't want to use the word organized labor has been used because I don't have that as a fact. What I also know is that when strike actions are on, there are negotiations, you know, there are concessions. Some of these concessions you go and take for them to go back. Some of the workers may not be happy. But you see, when you are to call off strike, you are looking at the broader interests of the economy. You are looking at the broader interests of the nation, sometimes more than you alone. So as leaders, we cannot be reckless if we know that we've gone on strike, and then we'll, the strike gets to a point, if we don't call it off, it will cause irreparable damage to the economy. We will not do that. When we become responsible that way, someone somewhere will say, ah, but you said you've gone on strike, and then you have called off the strike. 
But there are, when there's a need to call off the strike, I think that uh, we should do that because we are responsible leaders. Edward, thank you for coming. Thank you. Edward Karua is a trade unionist. He's been here with us discussing issues of concern uh, to organize labor. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you same time next week. I'm Kamenia Mano. Bye-bye.